Um, hi everyone, my name is Tony Prakanis. I am a student here at Stanford. And uh, just a brief outline of my talk, I'm going to give you some general background on robotics and robots. Um, what I'm mainly going to be talking about today is how we got our robot to go get us a cup of coffee and bring it back and all the trouble and things that we learned along the way. Um, so first I'm going to give you some general background, then I'm going to take you through some of the different little steps that we have. Uh, first starting with just getting the robot to drive, uh, doors that we had to go through, and elevators that we had to deal with, object passing, which is really cool. And then I'm going to talk about some lessons learned about robotics and life in general from this whole experience. Brief start statement about my lab. Um, I work in the Salisbury Robotics Lab. It's uh, mainly what we do is like medical robotics and haptics. We also do personal robotics. And uh, the way we do that is with this guy here called the PR2, who is an offshoot of PR1. And the basic story is that we created PR1. Two of our grad students uh, back in the day created it. Um, and then that got spun out to this company called Willow Garage, funded by some of those uh, rich Silicon Valley guys. <laughs> and then that came back to us as PR2, and they gave us a PR2. So sort of this nice little loop. Um, just throw some extra confusion in there for you. Um, about the PR2, this thing is uh, quite a beast. Um, it costs $400,000 plus. It weighs 400 pounds, so you kind of just get out of the way. It starts rolling. Um, <laughs> there's also more, apparently, I, I recently found out there's more battery power in our robot in terms of uh, energy density than a Prius has. Um, and there's also this sort of kitchen sink of various sensors in the robot. There's la laser scanners, color cameras, connect like stuff. Two, and in addition to that, there's two arms, um, head, a pan tilt head, just a ton of mechanical features. You'll see all these features throughout the talk today. And, uh, and it's really just designed to throw all that stuff out there, see what we use, and then get rid of all the things we don't to create the next version. Um, and so the robot also comes with this very, very important thing is a software package called ROS. And that basically takes a lot of the grunt work out of robotics. There's a big section of my talk that kind of tells you what ROS does, and it'll, it'll be evident how much it really does and how much it helps. And um, yeah, don't try to do robotics without Ross. You will waste your time. Um, so just a little bit on the task. Uh, in the upper left, you can see the Clark Center. Um, our lab is sort of in the lower right corner of that picture on the first floor. On the third floor is the coffee shop, the Pete's Coffee Store. And uh, there's also those doors and the elevator. Um, and so just a little background on what personal robotics is. And personal robotics is the creation of robots that live and play sort of in, uh, in our own spaces. It's a very up close and personal thing as evidenced by that. The ideal thing is like Rosie from the Jetsons is what we, what we really like to achieve. And um, it faces a lot of challenges that are not present in other forms of robotics. So, you know, a drone that's out flying above us doesn't really have to worry about, like, safety issues, doesn't have to worry about, you know, getting stuck on your door because you decided to change the lock, you know, those sort of things. And, and so there's an extremely diverse set of objectives and this really unpredictable, unstructured environment. And so my solution to the challenges is to use sort of your human intelligence to understand what the task the robot needs to accomplish is, and then develop a very simple, logical approach for the robot to do it. Um, and so this project is really a demonstration of that approach. Uh, just important qualifications, we're not, um, once I pushed the button to start the project, to start the robot, I did not allow myself to touch it. Um, the only interaction, or to control it in any way, the only interaction was natural interaction with humans to purchase the coffee and also to hand it back at the end. Um, and also, we didn't allow any modification of the environment. You don't want to modify these environments because people people just don't want to like put stickers all over their home so their robot can work. And you know, kind of defeats the, the purpose of building the robot. Okay, so you know me talking is boring. So um, let's face it, I'm kind of boring. So <laughs> let's um, start the video. Where are you, video? Okay, so what we're going to start off with here is just a little navigation demo. So you can see the robot sort of driving through the building here. Um, there's a lot of junk around that's avoided. Oh, that was so loud. Um, and there's a person. And you can see the person sort of jumps in front of the robot. So the robot sort of stops and it, it fears off um, and goes around her. Um, 
and avoids her. There's a whole video on YouTube of this whole process that, you know, if you want to watch, you can. Yes. It worked. Okay. So how does it do that? How does it get through environments? How does it avoid people? Um, so there's two sensors that, so the first step is we have to make maps of the environment. We want really detailed, accurate maps of the environment. And the way we do that is the first step is we, do, we just drive the robot around manually and make a map. And there's two sensors that we use for both mapping and navigation. They're the little laser scanners, like this guy. Um, those give us really detailed analysis of the, uh, the surrounding environment. Thousands of points per second uh, and high accuracy distance to obstacles. The other sensor is we have counters in the wheels of the robot that measure how far the robot has traveled. And so those are actually really accurate. So over like the course of like say a meter, those sensors are just as good, are really accurate. But there's air, and that air term builds up as you go. So what you do is you, you use the map, you use the laser data and this wheel data to filter together with this algorithm, and you make a map of the building. And then you sort of save that map to disk, and then whenever you use the robot, weeks, hours, months later, you dump that map in. And um, you do that, so then once you have that map in, you can then use a similar algorithm to then figure out where you are on that map at all times, have really accurate knowledge of uh, where the uh, robot is at all times. Um, and once you have accurate knowledge of where the robot is, you can then sort of build this cost map grid of where all the obstacles are. And then you can run algorithms that are well known from, the, from video games of all things, and just well known in AI community in general, to just click and have the robot drive anywhere on that map. And there's sort of this dynamic uh, approach to updating the map, so when people jump in front of the robot, you add more obstacles to it. And so this is all really cool. Um, I wish I could take credit for this, but this stuff comes with the robot. Um, the problem was it's all 2D. So we decided to make it, I guess if you would, 2.5D. I, uh, I took this algorithm and I, I made it so you could have different maps linked together by sort of portals. Um, doors, elevators, that sort, even just walls. <coughs> the robot drives through these portals and it switches between the maps. Um, so that's really cool. But now, and so that's great. And now the robot can drive around. But, you know, it actually needs to do stuff once it gets to the goal. <coughs> Fortunately, we also have these doors between us and the robot. So I'm going to show you how the robot takes care of those. Okay. Where did you go? Oh, did you do that? Okay. Oh, you're hiding. Okay, excellent. Sorry. So the first step is pushing open the doors. And so the robot's right now lining up. There's a door right there in front of it. It's lining up on the door, and then you'll see it spin around and blast through the door. <laughs> uh, this process is called door blasting because it scared the heck out of the secretaries the first time I did it. <laughs> you see it lining up again, and then bam. Um, and that's, yeah, okay. Stop. Okay. Yeah, so it just, it's kind of fun, um, actually, to do that. So how does it do that? So the issue here is one thing that you have to understand is these doors are transparent. They're designed to be see-through. You're not supposed to be able to see them. And they're also very heavy. Um, people actually struggle a lot to open these doors. It's kind of fun to watch them all struggle to get in the lab trying to open these really heavy doors. Um, There's a problem when handicapped people can't open them, but that's another story. So the PR2 uses mechanical approaches. So we use mechanical approaches to solve this. And you have to use the entire strength of the robot to overcome them. It's pretty cool. Um, so the, the way to open them is you have to, the, when we drop out of navigation, we're actually pretty accurately aligned with the track door. We're in with, within a couple of, within a foot, let's say. Um, and then once we do that, there's this whole process to line up with the door. And basically we use the laser scanner and we kind of take through each axis. So like we want to line like this, the door, we want the robot to be at a fixed distance. And it needs to tilt. Its, it needs to uh, line up rotationally and then horizontally. And it's, it's important to do those axes in that order; otherwise, things kind of get messed up. Um, and the trick here was that the central window left a hole in the laser data compared to the wall, and that's how we saw the door was actually the lack of the door. Um, and the other thing that's important is when the robot's done, it sort of 
backs through the door and he saw the bar handle on the door. We want the robot to hit that and so it would not have a chance of breaking the glass. Which is one of our fears was that the robot's just gonna flake the glass and like just horrible things were gonna happen to everyone involved as a result. <laughs> um, so then the robot sort of gets outside and now that's great. And so you can see the robot here driving, obviously sped up because it's really boring just watching the robot drive around, on um, the 20X. And now it's going gonna, it's gonna to do the, the same exact model of the work the other way around. Um, and one of the issues there is that the sun, you know, blocked the robot and messed up. So I had to mess around with it a lot. It's just, you know, the, the kind of issues you find out only when you do the testing. It's like, oh, the sun messes up the laser data. So you can see it sort of lining up on the door and then it sort of actually feels where the door is with its hand. It's completely blind right now. No computer vision at all, no sensing, just a completely blind approach. Um, it's not very smart either, but it works really well. And you can see it lining up on the door, it hits the handle, and then since it's just a fixed distance, bam. <laughs> and now there's a sort of elaborate dance that it does to break through the door. <laughs> so you see wedging the door right there, full of <laughs> And we are through the door. <laughs> so that took quite a while to get working, but it was well worth it. Okay. So, um, so the asymmetry is that on the inside there are no handles. There are no handles. And yeah, there's no handles at all. There's nothing on the inside. There's just the door. Yeah. And like you're, I'm actually glad that they, they were transparent because I would have been screwed if they weren't. Yeah. Um, so detecting the handles was also really hard because if you look at the handles, oh, yeah. I tried different vision-based approaches, but if you look at the handles up close, yeah. they're reflective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so they, ref they create all these lines and edges from the reflective materials. And also the color is completely random. If someone with like a Stanford shirt stands in front of it, it's gonna be red. Someone with like a black shirt stands in front of it, it's gonna be black. So it's just completely random. Um, and so I kind of just gave up at trying to sense them. And so, but you know, all objects, when the robot hits them with its gripper, they're, uh, they're gonna stop the gripper. Okay, so the other thing that happened was that the robot needed to line up straight with the door. When it just drives into the door, it's actually not like flush against the door. So you know this sort of waggle dance that the robot does? And when it does that, it gets flush with the door. And therefore, it always slides sideways along the door properly. I'm sure not to be a real problem. Um, okay, now that we busted all these doors, we had to face the last obstacle before we got to the coffee shop, the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> Which was uh, an interesting one. And it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite complicated. Um, you can see, okay, you can see here we have more people, and these people are actually involved in some, why are you not, like, okay, there we go, some boring meeting and they're actually complaining about the robots. I basically said, shoot, go away, we'll, we'll leave. Uh, and so the first step here is to call the elevator. You can see there's a little button there and the robot's gotta push the button. So it's got its hand out. There's a camera right here in the hand and uh, that's what's using the look for the button. And there, there goes the elevator. So now it pushed the elevator button. The problem is elevators don't always come when you push the button. So you gotta push them again. Um, and so there it goes. So the elevator actually took too long. It just missed it. Um, it has a 30 second time out, took like 35 seconds. And then it went again. <laughs> so there's a, I'm speeding it up a lot because it's really boring just watching the robot sitting there staring at the elevator. There's little lights up on top of the, the elevator and that's what used to detect it. Not have to enter the elevator really fast. Otherwise the door will close before the robot can get in. You also see people are in the way. So, one of the other things it does, if there's people in the elevator, it'll leave. Because we don't want, it's really scary riding the road with the elevator. Someone <laughs> push the elevator button. Yeah, it's really scary. Um, someone push the elevator button and summons it before it could push the button. And it's using mechanical alignment in there because of the same shininess problem. Now it's got to wait to exit out of the elevator. And the problem is there's three floors. And so you don't know which one you're actually on. There's actually four floors. Um, and so see the little sign there? We're actually reading that sign to know when we exit the elevator. Okay, we'll stop that there. And go back over here. 
Okay. Um. So you saw the overview. You know, push all these. You gotta do all this stuff. Uh, the first thing is obviously the sort of lining up, lining up with the laser, pushing the button. The key in all of these steps, waiting for the elevator. Um, the key in all of these steps is to make sure that if the mission fails, if you fail to see the next step ha happen, for example, the elevator fails to arrive or the door fails to open, you gotta try again. And you just keep trying again until you get what you want. Um, and so the robot just has an infinite loop until it, it gets what it wants. Um, and internally, you know, we gotta push all those buttons. Um, internally, the key is alignment. We do the same mechanical alignment tricks we do to line up with the door. Just kind of push yourself into the right corner of the elevator. Because the elevator button's always gonna be in the same place with respect to the, the door, or with respect to the physical elevator. And so it's really easy, actually, once you get that alignment working, just to copy and paste it and get them all to work. Um, so exiting the elevator was also this problem with checking to the dark floor. In the original work that I published, I was actually looking for a little sign and there's this whole vision algorithm to like extract the sign and then you get like that, which is the little sign taken down to a three, I believe a 32 by 32 image or something. Um, and then we just did a comparison with all the saved pictures from like floor one, floor two, floor three. And that worked all right, but there's all these lighting problems. And you know, vision just doesn't like lighting problems. Uh, lighting change, it just, it has so many problems with that. So the approach we used to get around that was the robot has an accelerometer in it. And uh, when the elevator starts going up, you feel that, obviously when you're in the elevator. So I thought, okay, um, why not make the robot do that? And as soon as the, uh, we just, I made a graph, I said, all right, I took some values and I had it working really fast and it's never fit. Works every time. The key is just you gotta sense when the elevator starts going up, count, count time told stuff. Done. Um, and so this is the works every time. Okay. I'm not talking about elevators. Elevators. <laughs> Get them all. Okay. Come on. Holy. All right. So now you can see the robot driving to the coffee shop. And uh, there's more of these doors that the robot has to go through. There's two of them, in fact, but it'll go through fast. Once the robot gets to the coffee shop, there is the problem of waiting in line at the coffee shop. <laughs> uh, and that problem actually turned out I was really scared when I first started realizing it. So I spent some time in the coffee shop and figured out how people waited in line at the coffee shop. It turns out that there's a, there's a course in this coffee shop where the line forms by default. And so what you'll see is the robot kind of goes in here and it just drives that course. And um, if anyone gets in the way, instead of trying to go around them on this course, it has a different behavior, it'll just stop and wait for them to be out of the way. And the way it sort of stops is it also looks down with its head, which kind of is sad, but also lets us know that the robot is waiting and not just, you know, crashed. Um, <laughs> so, okay, we've already talked about this. Um, so now that we got into the coffee shop, we had to talk a lot about how to order the coffees. And so you saw the robot has a little plastic bag in its hand. Well, that bag is full of money, um, as well as a sort of ransom note style note that describes <laughs> what kind of coffee we want. And um, it's kind of weird, but it says like, we want this brand of coffee and um, you know we want like whatever size and whatnot, but we only order largest because the robot can't handle small. Another story. Um, so the first step is that so you have to give that to the barista. You also have to take the coffee cup from the barista and there's a cup holder that I mounted on the robot to stash it throughout all the navigation. Um, and so really what we need to do is understand how people pass objects to each other. My phone, this is gonna be my test object to demonstrate this. Um, so the way humans pass objects is two main approaches. The person who's gonna give out the object holds out his or her hand, and then the person who's gonna give the object places it into their hand. Or the opposite, I hold out my hand and place the object into my hand. It's, uh, it's sort of both directions. And what this means is that the robot can exploit this. So it never has to find the object. It just has to put, give the right social cues for the person to either take the object or give it the object. It's pretty cool. Um, and then once we discover this, humans are also really good at knowing when to let go of objects. If you want to try to try passing an object to someone, 
but we're really good at letting go of objects, and we never drop, we almost never drop objects. You can talk to me offline about some things about this if you're interested in it. Um, so the, the sequence that we developed for giving out objects is really simple. Um, just hold out the robot's hand, holding the object, tell the person to take the object, and then um, when either they, they give it a strong jerk or they pull the object, they pull the hand back through the object, we let go. And then once we're done, fold the arm back. That's critical to let the person know that we're actually done with that, and it's sort of a social cue, and they, they walk away as soon as they see that. Receiving an object from the human, I just took the same algorithm and flipped it around at first. And that worked really well, but it failed um, in a lot of cases. And um, the you know, just asking for the person, wait for them to push the hand back or to jerk the hand. But it failed because people, when you know the robot holds out its hand like this, they don't push the object all the way in. They don't you know, push the object all the way in the hand, they just go to hold it in front of the hand and expect it to grasp down. So again, there's that little forearm camera in the robot that we use for busting the elevator. And uh, what it is, that camera looks straight up at the gripper when it's holding its hand out, and you'll see that. And so when we see, when we see that object, we see like a change there, not the object, when we just see motion, we grasp at it. Now sometimes people will like hold the object in there and it'll slip out, they won't, you know, they'll wave their hands around in front of it and they'll think there's an object. Just all kinds of things happen that cause the robot to grip. And that's okay, because the robot grips, and if its gripper closed all the way, that means that there's no object in its hand. It failed. So it just says, okay, let's try that again. Opens its gripper, and we repeat the task. Okay. So now, the rest of the video. Okay. So you can see it going here. <coughs> And so we're holding out the paper, the plastic bag, and we also ask the coffee people. <laughs> <laughs> they love this, by the way. They uh, they were like super cooperative. I, I loved it. They gave us free coffee too. <laughs> but then I realized we were like sucking tons of people into the coffee shop. See what was going on with the robot. And so it was kind of cool. So there you go. Yeah, so there you can see taking the coffee cup away. And um, the coffee cup's in the plastic bag. We asked them to put it in the plastic bag even though we didn't really need it. Just so that if the robot, you know, if it spilled by accident, we didn't mess up the robot. Because I don't want to know how much trouble I would have gotten for that one. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you can see it. And now, so the robot has to go through all the previous steps in reverse to get back to the lab. So I'm going to skip ahead, because I think we're short on time, and um, go back to maybe right here to the last. So that's, you know, the double door that it came through? There's the double door. Um, and so I tried to be artistic and have the robots, like, reflection in the door. I don't know how I did that. Um, so this is from the inside. It's kind of cool watching it slide its hand across, and then bam, there you go. Uh, I've also, since this project, I've sped that up because it's really annoyingly slow. Um, it's, you don't really see how slow it is until you watch that. The other thing that's really cool, this is not me, this is just Ross being awesome. And you can see how tight it is in there between the people and the wall. But we got through anyway. And now we're done. And so now the advisor is sitting there. He's not on camera, but he's there. And so... Yeah, so at the end of this whole, uh, at the end of this whole project, <laughs> and so at the end of this whole project, I get to say that my whole summer project was getting my professor coffee. <laughs> so, lessons learned. I'd like to just go through this real quick. Um, so, it's really, this was a lot of fun. Honestly, most of the time it didn't feel like I was working, but you know, uh, it was still an advancement. And you know, there, this whole thing is really impractical in its current state. Um, you know, it just is. It's really slow. It requires, a, I, I watched the robot the whole time, just because the robot's so heavy, it's really scary to have the robot just running loose. So I was there the whole time to kill it. Um, however, it really can help. You know, someone's disabled, they can't, and they can't move, they can watch, be there watching the robot the whole time. And it's still useful for them. And that's some of the work that Will Abraj is doing, and it's amazing work. 
Um, it also could be useful for artistic purposes, I guess. Um, but I'm not really sure what you do. It's really cool to watch, regardless. Um, the second thing is computer vision, AI kind of stuff is cool. And it's useful, but it's not like a panacea. When you start getting into these scenarios, this is a really, um, you know, you, you really have to rely on your own intuition to make the robot do the right thing. And um, it's also very, the sort of very unpredictable thing. It's very hard to maintain. It's very hard to understand. It gets very complex. So these sort of simple approaches like slide your hand across the door, it's very easy. Everyone understands what the robot's doing and why. And it's very easy to maintain. Well, oh, no wonder the robot's failing. It's because we put little things on the door and the robot's hand gets caught in the things. Instead of like, well, um, I don't really know why this giant algorithm didn't work. Um, or I don't know why it did. It's just, it does. It fails, you know, whatever percent of the time. The other thing is about failure. It's really hard to get the robot to work every time. There's always stuff that happens that makes it not work every time. It's really easy, it's for varying grades of easy, to get some number of nines in your reliability number. Um, and, you know, you just kind of, just don't be, a, I guess this is good advice for life in general. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid, afraid to retry. You know, if you fail, if the robot fails, it can just detect when it failed and try again. And that's a lot more effective than just trying to cover all the cases. Um, so now, just some future work that I'm interested in doing. So one of the problems that came up with this is robotic software, the software stack eventually got very messy from a code standpoint. And that's just because there isn't really a good development model. Like we have a good like system for developing, say, websites. It's well understood, it's predictable, everyone knows what it, what it does. So my sort of future research is like how we can take those sort of same techniques and clean up the process of robotic software development, make it easier, and make it easier for people to share code and to build off of each other's code. And it's really critical that we do the fact because it's obvious that we're going to write a lot of software. I mean, you saw like the simple task, we had the elevators, we had the doors, we had to write all these different programs for each one of them. And so it's just a lot of software. Um, and so I'm trying to develop a next generation approach to handling this problem, but developing an easy to use framework for specifying what the, robot, what the robotic software does, and that way we can automatically merge it all together. Okay, so questions. And, um, Pass me that empty bag. Thank you. Please take the empty bag. Thank you.
Please take the money and paper instructions. Yeah. See? <laughs>
Please take a cup. Thank you.